That's Caleb. Oh my gosh. Oh my, oh my gosh. <laughs> Caleb. Wow. Wow. Very cool. We're All still right. looking for Haley Jane. She'll be coming on. Yeah, she's coming. All right, there's Nicole. Kim, I love it. All right, well, hello everybody again. I'm Denise Hyde, Community Builder with the Eden Alternative. I gotta tell you, these Friday calls are just so um, heartwarming and wonderful. So thank you all for carving out time to come together. Um, I'm loving it, I hope you're loving it. Get in the chat box, let people know who you are and where you're from so we can start like getting the chat going. Um, and I am actually not gonna facilitate today. I'm gonna kind of sit in the background and Laura Beck, my teammate who is extraordinary, um, will be your facilitator for the day. Jack, you're back. Good to see you again. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Laura, the floor is yours. All right, Jack is going for the Zoom background effect. He's got his blue screen up, ready to go. Can't wait to see what you come up with there. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Laura Beck. I'm the Learning and Development Guide with the Eden Alternative, and I'm really excited to get to facilitate, engage you in a slightly different kind of conversation today, but we thought we would check in with a couple of special guests today. Um, I hear someone coming on, pretty cool. We have um, some elders who have joined us today, and I want to start by introducing them, giving them a chance to speak. Our focus today, and we'll check in with the elders first on this, um, is how does loneliness, helplessness, and boredom impact, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody if that's all right. There we go. How does loneliness, helplessness, and boredom impact employee care partners and family care partners? We know, um, and just let's do that little thing that Denise did at the beginning of the other webinars where we kind of set the stage, got on the same page about the lingo we're using and the things that we're talking about. And at the Eden Alternative, if you're still relatively new to us, what we teach is that there are three plagues of the human spirit, and that's loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And that honestly, it impacts everybody on the care partner team. And when we talk about a care partner team, we're talking about the individual that we are supporting and focusing um, our attention on in terms of meeting their unmet needs but also all the rest of us who work with that individual, collaborate with that individual, partner with them um, to create a caring environment wherever all of those people live and work. So that said, we know that not just the elders are experiencing isolation and a sense of loneliness at this time, but it's very likely, right, that as employee care partners or family care partners, as we're all dealing with quarantine and whatever form that's taking, we are probably feeling it too, right? And so we have a question today that I want you to mull over um, and then be prepared. And we're gonna kind of tackle the conversation from a couple of different directions. What we teach also at the Eden Alternative is that the best way to um, really understand a concept or to appreciate someone else's experience, we need to get in touch with it within ourselves first. So as you know, for those of you on the line that are employee care partners and family care partners, and we really want the elders to think about this too in terms of their uh, care partners who are you know, supporting them and collaborating with them, how does it show up for you? What are the signs when you are beginning to notice that you're feeling lonely, helpless, and bored? And when we think about this in the context of COVID, right, you could be going 90 miles an hour. You could be um, doing crisis management like a pro at the speed of light. You could have people all around you and still you might notice something doesn't feel right. I'm starting to feel alone in this crowd, et cetera. I feel helpless. You know how that feels in your body and in your heart and in your mind. And so think about how it shows up for you. What are the signs for you when that starts to become present for you? The next thing that we want you to connect with is when you feel that, what do you think you need? And then we're gonna get into creative solutions and ideas um, a little bit later. But I'd like to start by checking in with our um, guest today, 
who are elders. Judith, do you are you interested in sharing any thoughts you have about the people that are your care partners and how loneliness, helplessness, and boredom plays out for you guys? Um, I'm not sure how it affects one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm fairly lucky. I'm in a fairly small place. I, I have 58 residents here. I don't have family in the city that I live in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not used to having a lot of visitors anyway from outside. So that part of it doesn't worry me too much. I can see in that what the carers are doing around the place is very different to what they would normally be doing. Mm. Um, having to not have too many people around and er everything's changed. I'm not sure that it's a bad thing. Um, I, I think as long as we're all informed and we are very informed about the whole thing, I'm not sure everyone understands all the information they're given. Um, but I think being informed about it makes it easier for us all to understand. We don't like it, none of us do, but we understand this is the way it has to be. Right. Um, so it makes it a, a little bit easier, I think. Thank you so much. You me, let me put me you on anyway. the spot. Oh, oh, say it again. I didn't mean to cut you off. What was I the just said part? for me, for me, that's the way it is anyway. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for letting me. I, I, you didn't get a lot of warning there, so I appreciate you jumping in. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and, you know, Jack, I'm wondering if you would be interested in chiming in. It's been a couple of weeks now, you know, since you first joined us. Things have been changing pretty rapidly. And just wondering what you're seeing with you and your care partners. How does that look for all of you? Uh, well, thank you very much. I, uh, for one thing, I think we're the same as you all are. So, uh, you, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, if we are elders, are you youngsters? I'm not sure how that plays out because I know that, uh, uh, you know, my own children who are now in their 60s uh, don't like to be treated like children. So I think we're all adults in this together. And some of us are just further along life's, uh, life's spectrum. But uh, you mentioned uh, loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, and I'll, I can talk to that a little bit. Uh, on the loneliness, I think that affects people who are extroverts differently from those of us who may be more analytical. So again, that's not a, an age-related thing or a generational thing. That's uh, strictly uh, just uh, what it is. And uh, my wife just, gave me a note here, but <laughs> it gets a little complicated. But anyway, um, I was thinking about how comedians are struggling. Most comedians are extroverts. So if you watch Stephen Colbert mm -hmm. or any of these comedians, they aren't able to handle not having an audience. And uh, But there are people who actually love solitude and they're probably pretty contented. So. Uh, here where I live, we have a, uh, we, we, we residents initiated a daily Zoom call at three o'clock, and we usually have about uh, 10 to 15 residents who get together and talk. And where it's paid off tremendously is because those residents who are isolated in our skilled nursing facility, they're able to come on to Zoom and interact with us and have a social contact and have contact with people other than nurses and uh, that they're finding that uh, positive. Another initiative that we residents have undertaken is that we've bought a, um, we, we raised some money among the residents and we bought some echo show devices and we uh, deliver them to the care center so that spousal couples who are separated because one's in the care, in the skilled nursing and the other is in independent living, they can have daily visits with each other 
through the Alexa devices. And we found that uh, that's particularly good because they have a drop-in feature. So people who are past the point of being able to use technology are able to respond to a drop-in by a spouse. So uh, that's uh, interesting. Boredom, I think, is a problem at all ages. And uh, uh, to some extent, it comes by feeling you don't matter. So the, our management, who are youngsters, if you will, they, they like to welcome suggestions from the residents, but they don't want the residents to be part of the implementation of that. And uh, that's a, a very big factor. So we've had a number of in resident initiatives. For example, we have a renowned epidemiologist who's a, a, a resident here. And he worked with Tony Fauci and he's been espousing masks. Well, there, they, it, and he's on his own initiative said everybody should be wearing masks. Only today are we being uh, told to wear masks, and that's only because the county ordered the management to do it. So that has a big effect in how uh, elders feel. When we're treated like elders and therefore no longer functioning people, that, that diminishes one's self-esteem and you no longer feel that you, you matter. So uh, that's a big factor. And, the, and I guess that really goes to what you were referring to as helplessness. The most debilitating experience that anybody can have psychologically is to feel that they're helpless. And when their suggestions go un, unnoticed and unmentioned, and when the management says, here's what we're doing, and the communication is all one way, top down, then that diminishes the life experience and, and and makes you wonder well why am I continuing on this on this earth and I'd say that we have quite a few people uh, particularly people in their higher upper 90s who become come life weary they just say why am I having to go on and I think that's something that we can reverse by just treating everybody as a productive human being we all have our gifts, and we all are able to make a difference. Uh, I probably talked too long. No way, it was awesome. Thank you so much. Again, I just kind of grabbed you. <laughs> um, I would love to introduce um, Haley Jane Thomas, who is with us today. We are blessed um, with her presence. And hey, Sarah Stewart, um, are you hanging out there with Haley Jane? I see your hands clapping. <laughs> Would you like to say hello along with Haley Jane to all? Sure. Of oh, yes. disembodied voice. <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh, I was hi. wondering if I, hi, hi. Hi, hi, um, hi. Everyone's waving at you. <laughs> I, I was wondering, Haley Jane, if you and Sarah would like to speak to um, what it's like to be care partners there in your home at this time um, in terms of this subject and what you learned from each other uh, in terms of dealing with loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. What are you going to say, Janus? What do you want to say? She says she's actually pretty, very good at entertaining herself um, all the time. Anyway, she's very, you know, I think she, she certainly you know, it's very different. We don't, you know, we've, no one can come. She doesn't see her mom every day, and that's really hard. But she talks to her mom over the phone, and they FaceTime all the time. And um, she continues to be naughty. Uh, her mother will be, be upset with me for saying that, but she, she continues to be mischievous at times, right? Right? She's acting very demure right now, so... But she's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a different way of life, but we're, we're very, you know, like we're, we don't mind doing it because we, you know, we're, we, we don't want, um, you know, we can't afford to get the virus here at all. So we're just very diligent, not letting anyone in, include, you know, which I know it's really hard, but it's just what we have to do right now. And um, luckily we do have a lot of, you know, tools at our 
service that we can do. We sit out on the porch and wave at people walking by, and there is a lot of people walking by. And um, Bella the dog came in today, didn't she? Yes. And um, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's tricky, but we're all doing what we can, you know, lots of washing and cleaning and uh, socializing through. She was, I had, my best friend had a birthday uh, two days ago and I was working. So Haley and I, we joined her birthday party Zoom in. So that was fun too. <laughs> right, Janus? Yes, yes. She's uh, normally a little more, uh, she's taking it all in. She like, she knows something's going on, like not quite, you know, like she knows uh, something's going on, right, Janus? Yes, she says, but thanks for inviting us. Oh, Haley, Jane and Sarah, so glad, so glad that you're here to see you both. You look um, great, Laura, too. Everybody does. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a long time. That's I, I know. <laughs> so awesome. I, I love that we've got the conversation started. And so I'm wondering if the rest of you had a chance to mull that over, uh, whether you identify as an employee care partner, a family care partner, or both, it doesn't matter. Um, what are the signs? How do you begin to notice that you're starting to feel the impact during this period in time? Uh, regarding the plagues, loneliness, helplessness, or boredom? And then what do you need when that feeling comes up? Would anyone be willing to speak up, maybe share a story about this as these weeks are going by, what you're noticing in your teams, whether the care partner teams at home, whether you're in a nursing home or senior living? Anybody want to take a moment? Yes. Is that Angela? Hey, how are you going? <clears throat> I'm a um, care partner at the home with Judith. So um, right now I don't feel helpless, lonely or bored because we are um, hitting for running. But I know that there are, um, my position is lifestyle coordinator. So I, I'm quite, um, we're having to adapt everything. So we've gone, we now still can have um, small groups of three. It's gone from 10 to five to three. Um, we're waiting for it to be, one on one it hasn't mm -hmm. happened yet um but i think um amongst a team and i think judith would probably also agree with this you can tell when the personalities change amongst staff when they're normally bright happy and bubbly or usually things aren't an issue little things can become a problem um and it, i think um i know i'm being particularly um conscious of it amongst my peers and just make, making sure i'm checking in with them um, if, we do, if you do notice a change, that's not not normal. Um, but I think, um, like we've all said this, everyone said this before, we're all in this together. And as Judith mentioned, um, you know, everyone knows what's going on and we're not doing this on our own and we're all navigating this um, as best we can with what, you know, however we can. Um, but definitely communication is talking to people, um, having... Um, making it a safe environment to be able to express what's yes. what's impacting you and you know not having any judgment all that sort of stuff because none of us know when you know how you are going to react to something especially something we've never dealt with before um because this is big in and we know this is going to be a long time <clears throat> we've had um lockdown or isolation before where it's been two weeks and we've had cabin fever after that <clears throat> we know that this is going to be months of dealing with this. So um, just trying to, just having those conversations with people and making sure that we are, we know we're all in it together and no one is on their own. And again, you that just that safe environment to be able to talk to people and let know what's, let people, what's, let people know what's going on. <clears throat> um, and also um, acknowledging that, um, sometimes now it's going to be harder than ever to be able to leave things that leave things at the door when you come to work. So the impact of other um, your family members losing jobs and you know not being able to pay the rent and all that sort of stuff is going to be weighing on people's minds, and they're not going to be able to switch off when they are at work. Um, so allowing that to be um, acceptable as well. 
Thank you so much. That was a brilliant um, compilation of experiences there, really important. And I love that Dr. Thomas, and maybe you want to just speak to it yourself, Bill, do you want to talk about the piece around the stigma of loneliness? Well, actually, I thought that uh, Angela did a great job on that. And I, uh, as I was listening, I was just recalling that um, it's astonishingly difficult to experience um, hard times alone, be the one person who's having hard times. I, I can remember in my own life um, losing someone I, I loved and and the sky would be blue and the sun would be out and people would be all walking around like, don't you understand the world has ended? Yes. And uh, it, it took me you know, time to realize, you know, I'm going through this. What's different about this is that we're all going through it together. And nothing that's happening right now is any person's fault. So, you know, you mentioned a person um, struggling to pay the rent. Yeah, struggling to pay the rent, like a lot of people and through no fault of your own. It's not like you went to the casino and lost all your money. Um, we're in this together. So what, when we think about the antidotes to you know, loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, big number one is we're in it together. And the tough stuff that's happening is not any individual person's fault or failure. It's, it's a world historical event and we're living through it together. And I just, I'll, I'll stop, but I want to connect back to what Jack was saying because um, I think he's really making the point that if we don't connect to meaning and we don't connect to uh, being part of a historical narrative together so that there's a reason to get up out of bed and do our thing, if we don't make that connection, then loneliness, helplessness, and boredom will have their way with us. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you. Jude, were you wanting to pipe in? No? Okay. I, I'm seeing in the chat box just to back that up. I'm a comment. I'm seeing people push back against the incredible helplessness that they feel searching for purpose and a way to be of service. Um, so, okay. Um, and you know, as far as I'm concerned, when you share about the signs, what you're noticing, maybe how teams are working together to be paying attention to each other to protect against loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. If you have, you know, people have been showing what kinds of things they're doing to protect against that or to create creative solutions, just, jump in with that. Feel free to, to offer that any, at any point in this conversation. Is there anybody else who wants to jump in right now? I'm like going through three pages of Zoom looking for faces that want to speak. Laura? Yeah. Just um, in thinking about the plagues, and, and um, I think it was Jack who said, introverts are having a harder time than extroverts. It's funny. I'm really more of an extrovert my daughter is a major introvert and the roles are a little bit reversed. I am not having as much difficulty with the loneliness mm -hmm. as I believe she is, although she loves her alone time. And we talk about that, of course, at Eden. So I think it's more on an individual basis and what we're doing perhaps to, to reach out and, and, and find that antidote, right? But I am having the major problem, and that's what Jill just commented on, with helplessness. And not mm -hmm. helplessness for me or anything that I'm dealing with, but like a, a world, a helplessness for the world. You know, what can I do for the world? And that feels heavy. That, that's a heavier thing. Boredom comes and goes, and I find things to, you know, mm -hmm. fill the void there. But the helplessness is almost crushing. And on a big picture level, right? Yes, like, yes. Not for myself, right? Yeah. For the big picture. No, I, I, I hear that. Um, I'm just looking to see if anybody else wants to pipe in. Yes, Jennifer. <laughs> um, so what's interesting, though, when you're talking about um, introversion and extroversion, um, I am that infamous uh, in extroverted introvert. Um, and it's a very weird place to be in terms of, of this helplessness that certainly we all feel with that greater lack of power over what's happening to us. But where my bigger sense of helplessness is, is 
all of these people who are now reaching out who never have, right? So all these people who want to connect because they're feeling alone, they're feeling isolated, and me not feeling like I have the bandwidth for them. Um, and because it's not my normal, you know, and the, mm -hmm. please don't, please don't judge me that I talk, I'm very close with my family, but I talk to my mom maybe every six months, you know, and now it's every two days or every three days or, um, and that's not, that's just not just my mom, but all of my siblings and all of my friends and all of my other care partners. And it's a horrible feeling to feel like I don't want to talk to you when everybody is feeling this desperation to be spoken to. So don't forget about us people over here that are like, Ooh, I am, <laughs> I haven't had a space because a lot of us aren't completely alone. We're in a place where we're into forced closeness, right? And if you're not used to forced closeness 24 seven, it's a lot. <laughs> so yeah. don't forget about us out there. <laughs> and that's what I love about what we teach, right? Through the Eden Alternative is the power of knowing each other really well. Um, and how different we all are. And that is really going to show up at times like this. Is there anybody who um, is chomping at the bit as I scroll through three pages here? Ooh. Yes, Effie. So oh, like, there you are. It's, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling calm. I'm meditating. I'm doing, joining world healing things. And that's wonderful. Joining Zoom calls. But something interesting has happened. I'm over, I'm 70, and my daughter is now treating me uh, like, uh, like with kid gloves. I mean, she's in DC, but it's like these constant calls admonishing me for going out. Uh, I have to go shopping, I have no choice, but I'm in that over 70 range. So now I am, I am designated um, as somebody who's completely to be a shut-in, uh, helpless and not contributing uh, because of my age, which is, I, I'm finding it fascinating to deal with. And I'm pushing back, of course, because uh, that's what I do. Um, and I don't want to do that, but it's like I'm trying to maintain this sense of self. That's powerful. Thank you, Evie. Uh, uh, Laura, can I say something about that? Yes. Uh, I just want to say to everybody who's on the call, over the years, I've learned so much from Evie. Um, and I plan to continue doing so. And I, I think this is a, she's really pulling back the curtain on something that is being revealed in this context, but <clears throat> is actually for many, many older people um, is a, a fact of daily life. The infantilization of older people, that their frailty, uh, whatever physical frailty, uh, results in somehow in a loss of their autonomy and dignity. Or, to put it another way, the fact that they're frail means they must subordinate themselves to other people. And I, I just want to stand up for uh, the right of people to uh, live life on their own terms and make their own decisions um, at, at every age uh, after which we reach our majority. And again, you know, Jack was hitting on this earlier as well, you know, that we're, we're all, all of us on a journey. And because Evie happens to be 70, which is, by the way, Evie, a perfect age for you. Um, yeah. So uh, it doesn't mean that um, very loving people get to subordinate you uh, to their desires. And I, I, I think you can do a really big favor to the world by, you know, counseling and teaching the people who try to do that to you, that that's not proper behavior. Uh, I would just add, ask a question, uh, because my situation may be a little unique, but uh, I, I wanted my wife to have a social experience, so I moved into a CCRC. 14 years ago. Now, if I had to make that decision today, I probably wouldn't because there are many more resources to let people stay where they are. But my question is, is does the tendency of people who work in senior living to stereotype those they serve, to speak of them in the collective, have the effect of accomplishing the opposite of what it really wants? And one of the one of the people that I've been friendly with over the years is Katie Smith Sloan, 
who uh, leads a very large organization, and she's made it a cause to oppose ageism, but her organization is itself ageist, and uh, there are no uh, residents on their board, none. And, uh, the, and the voice of residents is, they do welcome residents to come to their meetings as long as they know their place and stay in it. So it, how can we transform the industry or disrupt the industry so that when most of you are my age, I'm 83 now, you won't feel diminished but merely because you've reached a certain chronological age. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that wants to pop in this moment? I see Curie, yeah. Well, I have, well, I, have really, I, have a, I have a question. I wanna loop back on this. I've been um, thinking about this conversation a lot and you know, I work with younger folks and older folks and I've been hearing about this struggle from both sides. And doctors have been in this, really in this question and inquiry around how do we foster, and I would love to hear some people's feedback on this, um, you know, particularly Evie, like how can we move towards intergenerational solidarity in this mm -hmm. rather than, you know, because I'm hearing younger saying, I'm afraid for my parents. I'm worried that they're not taking it seriously because of, you know, and I think, I don't think this is the case here, but for a lot of folks, ageism makes us unable, internalized ageism can make folks unable to see their own risk factor, um, which is like this tangled part of this. And there's also the right to folly that Bill is talking about. And we all as adults can make our own decisions about our own risk. And then also our rights to our community, you know, and our, like what we owe to our community to help keep our community safe through social distancing. And I feel like there's all of these really complicated nuances that I can't even get into now around this. And I'm really curious, how can we move forward in a way of solidarity rather than getting upset with each other, you know, across these generational lines and deepening that divide. And then I would love to hear, Abby, like how could your children have approached you in a way that would have fostered that solidarity rather than, you know, having them probably be like, oh, mom's not listening to us. And you being like, why are my kids telling me to stay home? You know, like what would have been the loving way through that? If it, so I, I can respond. First of all, she's an only child. And we've been, we're, we've been um, as close as can be, mother, daughter. So her, her, her fear is real. And it's not because I'm not aware, uh, and she knows that I'm fully aware of the risks and, and what precautions I have to take. My God, I was a, a, an infection control nurse at Pinion for a number of years. And so I, I certainly have a lot of clarity on that. Um, and, and I understand she's coming from a place of fear of losing me, of facing uh, my mortality as I get older and her loss of uh, one of the people she's closest to. So that's how I'm approaching it. I'm not getting angry at her or giving her a hard time. I'm, I'm trying to help her understand what her fear base is around this issue and to help her feel secure that uh, I have a lot of clarity. I am staying home except when I have no choice. And when I go out, I wear a mask and gloves and then I take a shower and a sauna and immune builders for two days. I'm not being foolish. So we've got to be clear on how we're approaching this. Love it. Thank you, Kyrie, for the great question. I'd love for people to pipe in on that. I also know that Star Piner had her hand up a moment ago, and I want to give you a chance to respond to whatever spoke to you. Well, for one, um, I know that everyone in the Eden organization has to be feeling really helpless with having to cancel the conference that was worked on so diligently and for such a long period of time. I was really looking forward to getting to know Mel and Evie better. Um, and I won't get that opportunity only through these calls. Um, Evie, we're in the same club, I'm 70. And I got the speech from my daughter-in-law yesterday about how I should be ordering groceries and not going to the grocery store and staying at home. Well, I'm at work because this is where my heart is. This is where my life is. And um, I want to support all the wonderful people who are working so hard. Um, I, I just feel like I need to be here and it's worse 
worth the risk that I take. We sent our secretary home yesterday. She was coughing and not feeling well, and we got her out of here. Uh, so everyone's a little bit up in arms, like, oh no, does she have coronavirus? <laughs> and um, it's scary times for all of us. And there are risks, but there have always been risks. Life is full of risks. I'm a pilot. I take risks when I get in my plane and go up in the sky. Um, you know, right now, the risk is so scary feeling because it's invisible. We can't see it. We can't. It's like I, I know my plane is a risky thing. Uh, if the engine stops, I have to rely on my um, brain to figure out how I'm going to get back down on the ground without an engine. But this thing is scary because it's so invisible and we can't see it. And um, that makes it just sit on us heavy. Uh, and I have felt that heaviness, but when I get together with this group of individuals, it relieves some of that heaviness. And I think that's why these calls are so popular and such a comfort to those of us who gather this way. Thank you so much, Star. And very cool to learn about the pilot thing, wow. Something new about you. <laughs> Always, always, um, always an opportunity for that. Anyone else? I'm just taking a quick scan through that Laura, wants to. Yes. Laura, can I just say something really, really quick? Um, in or response not quick. to this yeah. um, conversation is we are doing a Facebook live event Monday with Dr. Bill Thomas and Dr. Al Power. Um, it's at 3.30 Eastern time. All you have to do to, is come to our Eden Alternative Facebook page and you can pop in questions. And we're going to be talking about how do you balance risk right now. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about, about that. And the other thing I just wanted to say is this really could be, and I don't know, it's a balance of are we ready to reflect right now on, on what's happening. Some people are in a space where they can, some are in a space where they can't yet. But this could be one of the biggest um, experiential learning opportunities that we have to understand what it feels like to be institutionalized and to lose control over your life. And so, you know, it, and again, it, that timing of when do we really process it all, I don't know when the right time is for that, but I, we're learning an awful lot about what it feels like to live in an institution right now. I'm so glad you brought it up because I noticed that comment that you placed in the chat box. I thought it was really important. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be an interesting conversation when the time comes. Yes. And, and Mary just asked us to restate the time of the Facebook Live event. It is Monday, this coming Monday, um, at 1.30 Mountain, 3.30 Eastern Time. Um, if you go to our Eden Alternative Facebook page, um, and if you haven't already, like our Facebook page and follow us because that's where all the information is. And, and Jill, these are going to be happening over time. Not This isn't a one and done. There will be other special Facebook Live events where yeah. we bring people together Every to Monday. talk about. Yep, yep. And it will all be around things we deal with all the time, but in the context of what it's like to be living this moment with, with COVID-19. Can I just quickly jump in? Um, I just wanted to add to that um, comment about um, understanding what it's like to be isolated. So um, I before all this really blew up. I actually had time off work and was traveling in Italy um, before Italy got started receiving its cases. And then when I got back to Australia, um, it was within two days, or actually the day before I was supposed to go back to work, it was, it was um, uh, made that I wasn't able to come back to work for 14 days because I needed to, to isolate because I'd been in Italy. Um, and at the time I was extremely frustrated. Um, I hated it. Um, and because it wasn't happening here in Australia at that time, so this would be about five weeks ago, um, it was all fairly new down here. We were hearing about it, we knew about it, but it hadn't actually sort of hit the hit the shores here as bad as it or as you know, as bad as it's getting. Um, but it wasn't until when I got back to work and I realized that now I know what it feels like. And so it's actually given me a new lease on life in making sure that um, on, on resident to, for our elders to, um, to make sure that I can help when, it, when they're in that situation. So like 
not even knowing what day it was because every day was the same. Um, the, only, the only reason I knew what day it was is because what was on TV. So those sort of things, it really, um, it was just an experience that um, helped me understand what these guys go through a lot. So it was really a good experience, even though I hated it at the time. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, looking for anybody else who would like to jump in. Laura? Yes. Kathy, hi. Hi, hi Kathy. I just wanted to share an experience around balancing risk that uh, we've had with my mother-in-law, who uh, has 88 years of life experience and lives in a CCRC in a, a lifetime community near, not far from us on the independent living part of it. And um, has a wonderful, you know, network of friends. And, you know, they have for years been playing bridge and rummy cube and uh, all kinds of games and things that they love to do and get together. So for uh, a time, they did the isolation thing completely and they did not get together. And her group of friends, there's four of them have decided that it's w they're willing to take the risk and get together and play those games. It's hard for us because we can get concerned about her and her friends. But, she, but when, on those days when she gets together with them, I see the difference. In, I hear the difference in her voice and her demeanor. She's so much happier. She, she's, when she doesn't do that, she sounds depressed. So it's that, but that's the decision that those, let's say, four people have made. Um, uh, and there's nothing I can do about that. But, and um, I'm happy for her because she's happy and I'm depressed when she's depressed and I'm happy when she's happy. So it's a tough though thing around balancing risk and that people have the right to make their own decisions. So. Kathy, thank you so much. I see Rain with a hand up, yes. Oh, Rain, I think you're muted. I'm mute. There we go. Sorry. No worries. Uh, I want to add to what Kathy said. I've been speaking to some of our elders here in South Africa. And um, interesting, you know, they said, so, so, so what is the worst thing? And I said, well, you can die. And they said, well, okay, let's talk about that. And um, it opened up a whole different perspective on our, first of all, our inability to contemplate our own mortality, mm -hmm. our um, unwillingness, and I know there is a conversation at the moment going on around death, our unwillingness to talk about it. Um, and it was interesting to, to see, Kathy, exactly what you said, where uh, even my mother said, okay, well, let's work from that backwards. And, um, you know, I'm going to take a number of risks because you know what? I'm quite okay with where I am, who I am, and the fact that I've lived a good life. Mm. And that put a whole different spin for me on our, um, op well, I, w I won't use the word obsession. I want to use the word obsession, but our, um, our view on risk. And I think if we really start listening to the elders and shut up with our filtering of fear, mm -hmm. we will hear and see a completely different story. Even when it comes, and this is why I absolutely love what Jack said, even when it comes to, to what we perceive or sometimes project as loneliness, helplessness and boredom you know when when i look at many of our elders they have the most incredible capacity for um introspection for contemplation and that can only be done when you are quiet and i think that's why we are finding this so difficult we are finding what many elders are going through every day so difficult and we project onto them um, our inability to shut up and listen and just be. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting for me to say 
let's look at worst case scenario, death. Okay, let's talk about death and then move back to a point where I feel I am still living my life. And you know what? I've had a good life. Yeah, Thank would, you for sharing that. I would, I this is Jack, I'd, I'd uh, chime in on that. I'm at 83, I know I'm not going to live another 20 years. We know that, you know, so if somebody is 98, they, they're not expecting to have long life. So the concern changes, and this varies from individual to individual. Not everybody who's of a certain age is, a, is comfortable with the fact they're going to die. And uh, people have different ways of coping with that. But the fact is that by the time you reach a certain age, you know that uh, it's coming and you accept that. The main thing is you don't want to hurt other people and you have capabilities that you begin to live. And I'm imagining that many of you on this uh, conference who are youngsters, if I can use that term, uh, have experienced this, that when you're backing up with your car, your neck doesn't turn like it used to. So you, it's very difficult to see what's behind you. Now, when they came out with cameras, backup cameras in cars, boy, I was raced out and got one of those right away. Now, it's not that I wasn't able to still drive, but I have reduced capabilities and you don't want to have harm. And I, and that opens a whole another area because there are a lot of people who continue to drive who probably shouldn't. And we don't have a good way of differentiating that, that ability to drive. We tend to equate it with age instead of with capacities. Yeah. And so if we move away from characterizing the elderly as the elderly and start just seeing them as people with diminished capacity, then maybe we can treat them like we treat disabilities. And, uh, and we allow people with disabilities to continue to have the capacities that they do have and to be contributing members of society. And I, I think there are many older people who are able to do, I, I think it's wonderful that a lot of people want to pay, play Rummy Cube or whatever, uh, but some people still want to be productive and, and that's something that's greatly discouraged. So the only thing that we have left to do is to write books anonymously so people don't realize we're old and uh, I've, I find that that works well. If you if you publish something, people don't accept that you're too old to be saying it. Hope Carwile, I see that you very much want to share, so go for it. Thank you, Jack. Love that I'm, end point. I'm sorry, I'm biting at the bit over here because Rain and Jack and Evie have just got me going and, and thank you, I needed the energy boost. Um, yeah, so I have actually been sitting with just thinking of what, how would we be responding to COVID-19 if ageism, ableism, and our fear of death did not exist in our culture, what would it look like? You know, and I think that that's the true sickness here mm -hmm. is our inability to navigate what we want that to look like. And I, the core that you've been talking about with the helplessness and boredom and um, loneliness um, is at the root of us not addressing those issues right. and addressing those, that sickness, right? Mm -hmm. So to sit here and hear the way that Rain and um, Jack and Evie responded, it just enlightens my heart. I was feeling kind of tired earlier and um, thinking, gosh, how can I help my care partners who are really struggling, who are in the communities and are experiencing loss every day. Um, we have several individuals um, that have passed due to COVID and just the burden that that's placing on them. And we're slowly getting to that conversation of let's let's get real let's talk about end of life um let's let's talk about how we navigate this together um and i just so appreciate you having this time for us thank you thank you for showing up for it i see that um isabel tom would very much like to say something and so isabel you want to go for it hi sorry if it's loud i'm watching my three kids at the same time, but I really wanted to join. Um, I just wanted to share with you, um, I've been working in the field of senior care for a while, um, 
And um, I just wanted to share with you a book that I recently wrote, and it literally came out on March 3rd. Um, I didn't get to do all the book launch stuff that I usually do, but I, I'm 36 years old and I wrote it as a way to be a voice for the older generation because um, of my experience working in the field, but also caring for my own grandparents and parents. Um, and so I just wanted to share that resource with you. It's called The Value of Wrinkles, A Young Perspective on How Loving the Old Will Change Your Life. Because I just know that um, a lot of young adults, um, they don't see a lot of the things that our older you know, family members are going through. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. I'm sorry if there's a lot of background noise um, since I'm outside, but I just want to share that resource with you. I also have been writing a lot on my blog about just um, you know, ways to engage older adults during this time. And really, I say sweeten their stay at home experience, because I know it's hard for them. It's hard for all of us to stay at home. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Is Thank you. Also, would you repeat the name of your book? Um, it's called The Value of Wrinkles, A Young Perspective on How Loving the Old Will Change Your Life. Um, so, I mean, Bill, you know Judah and John Erickson, and they um, are some of the people who endorsed the book, and uh, Dr. Ira Bayak, just people that I've worked with throughout the years. So, take a look at it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Isabel. Anybody else that wants to pipe in? We have about nine minutes left. Conversation's been really rich. I'll share uh, real quick. Laura, I, I wanted to pick up on um, just uh, people's different reactions to anxiety and mortality mm -hmm. and the benefit of uh, taking that time to have that conversation and in include everyone. Um, uh, my team, which consists of uh, about 120 you know, in-home care workers and elders, uh, we're trying as frequently as possible to convene uh, learning circles, uh, conversations, uh, using Zoom to process what's going on. And in one of those conversations, um, it's really, it, it, it is typical for some of the younger folks to be, I think, uh, expressing the deeper existential anxiety, real fear of death. And um, so in one case, one of the, uh, one of the um, elders that we care for was participating and she, when, when one of the younger folks expressed her, kind of this real terror that she has of um, contracting this and, and, and dying alone. The fear was dying um, alone, you know, in a hospital or something. Uh, one of our, our clients said, um, you know, she can understand, understand the seriousness of that fear, but um, she said that's a fear that she had long came to terms with. She has no family and not a lot of connections. And she said, in this instance, she's taking some comfort in the fact that maybe she'll die with so many other people in this global experience. She's like, that means a lot to me. It gives my death more purpose. I shared that in this open conversation and everyone was just blown away by that perspective. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Kaven. You know, Bill, I wanted to circle back with you for just a moment. Um, there's a lot of fabulous stuff in the chat box, um, and it moves pretty quickly, as you've probably noticed. Um, you wanted to make a comment about the term elder. Do you want to jump that in at this point, or do you feel like, eh, you want to move on? Uh, just very quickly, just um, I can connect it to what uh, Kaven was talking about. Um, basically, um, when, I, when I use the term elder, I'm really referring to someone whose life experience has prepared them in such a way that, that they're able to teach us important things about how to live. So uh, Haley Thomas is on the, on the Zoom today. Uh, there she is. And um, Haley, I consider Haley to be an elder in the sense that she has taught me so much about how to live. Also her sister, Hannah now now passed, but um, Haley and Hannah, we always conceived of them as elders because of what they were teaching us, not related to their capabilities or their chronological age. And and here's where I want to connect um, to what Kevin was saying. Part of the process of really becoming an elder is losing one's illusion of immortality, and Jack was talking about this. It's that when you get to this place where 
you, uh, you understand deeply that you're a mortal being and that your time here is limited. It actually opens up n new domains of experience for you. So one of the things that's happening, and Kaven's story illustrates it, is people who have lost their fear of death are elders because they can help other people, younger people in this case, but help other people find their way forward in a very frightening and scary situation. So it's part of our, our national wealth that we have people around and with us and among us who do not fear death and do not believe they're gonna live forever <laughs> and understand what's happening in a, in a very deep way that younger people, because, of a, because they don't have as much life experience, sometimes really find difficult. So I would endorse um, what Kaven and Jack and a bunch of other, Isabel, a bunch of people are saying, Rain made a really good comment about this. Let's talk to people about life without the fear of death, life without the illusion of immortality. And let's put it into a context where actually people I call elders, meaning people I can learn from about how to live, can really help us all uh, cope with this in a, a more healthy way. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I thought it would take a moment as we're getting really close to closing to ask Mary Kay, Mary Kay, I realized that I didn't get to check in with you earlier. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to this conversation? Yeah, I want to thank you for letting me be part of this, first of all. And I was uh, going with uh, loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. Uh, kind of on the funny side, when I worked I prayed for the day that I would be able to sit back and just be alone and enjoy life. Uh, I'm never bored because at a very young age, we were taught not to be bored. We were always aware of the multitude of chores and helping others that was around us. So, you know, there's no room for boredom in anybody's life if they stop and think, what can I do? Helplessness, I don't feel helpless in any situation because I believe through my faith to let go and let God. And uh, when I was working for an outfit here in Denver. I worked with elderly, and our CEO was a very, very, very wonderful man. Um, and he stated a comment one time, and it says, children are our future, but our seniors are the reason we have a future. So if everybody would contemplate on what seniors, which I am one, have done for us to pave the way to the future and believe and have faith and trust in God. And I want to thank you all. It's been wonderful joining you, listening to you, wonderful ideas, inspiration, and a lots of love comes across this computer frame of mine from all of you. And I hope you can fill mine and know that you are always in my prayers daily. Thank you. That was a gift of a parting reflection. Thank you so much, Mary Kay. You're really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you all for being here today. I love how this conversation rolled and I so appreciate how easy you made it. Um, you were so willing to share yourselves. The chat box is freaking amazing. We'll be copying that and sending that along to you. There will also be access to the recording just as there always is through our Facebook page. Um, we can also send it directly to you as participants. And Denise, Eden Alternative Home Office team, 
we have four of these in the calendar. Are we doing more? Yep, yep, we're going, we've got these booked all the way through April. So if you signed up for today, you've got invitations for the rest of April. Um, and um, I will be sending you out an email with the links and the chat and all that kind of stuff. And um, all these resources are amazing that you guys are popping in the box. Um, and if you have ideas of like, where might we journey this conversation next, we would love to kind of hear your thoughts so you can reply to that email and just kind of let me know, you know, where you think we might steer the conversation next, what might be worth your time um, and your energy these days. So thank you all so very, very much, um, as Laura said, for joining us. We love you all, and we hope that you take care, and we see you next week, please. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank take you care, so much. Everyone. Stay